Good morning and welcome to Christ Church. Would you stand as we come before our God and worship Him together? together this morning because a young man named Ben is going to get baptized in this service. He's decided to surrender his life to Jesus and be risen to new life with him. Would you turn your attention to the baptistry and let's celebrate. Good morning, everyone. Like Madison said, this is my friend Ben, and he has decided today to give his life to Jesus. So Ben, I have some questions for you. Do you believe that Jesus is God's son? Yes. Do you believe that he is the savior of the world? Yes. And do you want to follow him for the rest of your life? Yes. All right. Your dad is now going to baptize you in the name of the Father, 
and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. here at Christ Church Word uh, and at the church we want every single person to experience completeness in Jesus and for that to happen we first must believe have faith that he is the son of God to be complete but to experience that completeness we have to believe what he believed and so we've created a resource called Pathways uh, where we go over three different topics uh, Bible prayer and community that those three areas help us to experience to grow to follow Jesus so that we can become more mature in him. So we would encourage you uh, to check out our website uh, today, or you can scan the QR code and check it out. Or if you want to have more of a face-to-face -face conversation, uh, you can go uh, talk to Mr. Pathways himself, Scott Insminger, right there. Look at that beautiful guy right there. You can go to our Pathways Center right on the other side of our cafe after the service, and he'd love to connect with you. Uh, we always want to be connecting with people at our church and connecting them with Jesus. So if this is your first time here or you're new, uh, we would encourage you uh, to go out of uh, the auditorium on your way out and stop at our welcome center. Uh, not a long conversation. We don't want your full life story. Unless you want to give that, you can. We'd love that too. Uh, but we just want to put a name and a face together and figure out how we can serve you and help you get uh, connected here and have the best experience at our church uh, that you can. Uh, we want to connect with you. We want to connect with Jesus. But we also want to connect with our community. And one of the ways that we have an opportunity over the next couple of weeks to do that is through a mentorship training program, uh, July 17th to 24th. It's a two-part training where we are partnering with Water Gardens and True Charity Initiative to figure out how can we help the people in our community who are homeless to get out of poverty. Because statistics show uh, that what people need most, what these people need most is not material possessions, but what they actually need is meaningful relationships. You see, they have no neighbors, they have no family, they have no community to support them, to surround them, to champion them. I know I would not be where I am at today without hundreds of people investing in me and praying in me. And so we wanna be a community that does that for a community in our area that most people uh, overlook. Um, I know for me, I've had the blessing and the opportunity to go down to Water Gardens the last couple of months and to preach. Uh, every, the first Sunday of every single uh, month, we send students down there to cook breakfast on Sunday mornings, and a lot of them, they teach, they lead worship, um, and we just serve that community. So if you have a student in high school, hey, I'd encourage you to sign them up for that. I know Tyler's always looking for more volunteers to do that, but after the service, after I've preached, I've had the opportunity to have some meaningful conversations with these people. One guy, uh, he came up and he actually wrote me a letter because uh, my wife and I, we had a miscarriage in November. And so I had shared a little bit of the struggle that we've been going through in that healing process. And he wrote me a letter and he just said, man, I'm praying for you because I know God can get you through that just the way that he's gotten me through my struggles. And I'm like, man. And a couple weeks ago, I got to have a conversation with John. And John was saying, hey, I'm not a Christian. I just want you to know that, uh, but I've struggled my whole life with mental illness, so I just want to sit down and have a conversation of what you think I need to be doing. And so I have got to meet some amazing people who need other people in their life, people who uh, often, like I said, get overlooked. So I'd encourage you. I know mentorship can be a big word, but that's okay. That's why we have this training for you to figure out, hey, I, I see a need and I want to meet a need, so how can I do that? So I'd encourage you to do that. But today, I want to uh, encourage you to stand up, meet some people around you, and say hi before we worship.
of y'all had an opportunity to catch up on what you've been up to this summer. Um, I love summertime. It brings a lot of really cool opportunities and different things like that. One thing that I love is summer camp. My family and I got to go down to a junior high CIY camp in Texas about a week ago, and it was really refreshing for our family. It was great to get to, get to sit in on those worship services together. And one thing that really stood out to me was there was one night where they did a really stripped down session. Like it was just a person and an acoustic on stage, which is something that's a little bit different for those big like camp settings. And one thing that they did with it was they taught the students different prayer postures and explained why we do the things that we do. Like why do we raise our hands? Why do we put our hands out in front of us? And I thought that that was really, really helpful. One of the postures that they talked about is the posture of having your hand out in front of you, having your hands out in front of you with your palm open. And they explained that that's something that the church has been doing for thousands of years. And that the early church would do that because they knew that they were coming into the presence of a holy God who is living and active. And so in worship, they wanted to be ready. They wanted to be prepared to receive what he had for them, to surrender their own things, to receive what he had. And I want us to get an opportunity to do that together this morning. Because what was true for the early church, what was true in that room at that camp, is true right here this morning in this room. Our God is here with us. We're in his presence. So we're going to pray a prayer together. It's going to be on the screen, and I'm going to ask us to actually pray it out loud. And as we do it, would you just put your hands out in front of you with your hands open like this, ready to surrender to God, maybe what he's calling you to surrender, and also to receive what he has for you because he is very real and he is with us. Let's pray this together. Jesus, you are the treasure that our hearts long for. Spare us the heartbreak of trusting in things that cannot hold the weight of our greatest hopes. Spare us the heartbreak <laughs> Hold on, there we go. Spare us the heartbreak of chasing after things that cannot bear the burden of our greatest sorrows. As our hearts will be most fixed on what we most treasure, kindle instead our love of you above all. Grant us strength and grace, even now, O oh God, to offer you our deepest adorations. As we worship you, May our hearts become more aligned with your heart. And may our minds be recentered on your goodness. Amen. It is this God that we come before together this morning as we sing. May we give him our full attention and recognize that he's near.
Every single week uh, when we gather, uh, we set aside time uh, for what we call Jesus table, the table. Uh, a lot of you might know it as communion. And we do this because this is what matters most to us. Who matters most to us is Jesus because of the sacrifice that he made for us on the cross. And it doesn't matter uh, what we're going through. It doesn't matter uh, what we have a line ahead of us uh, this next week. Uh, Jesus, the gospel, uh, is the firm foundation that we have to have in place. Without the gospel, without Jesus, we are no different than anyone else. And so we always revert back to the gospel because it is in the story of the gospel that we find the power of God and his grace at work in us. Uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul is writing to the church of Corinth <clears throat> and he is encouraging them to give financially to the spreading of the gospel. And he doesn't have a 20-page uh, uh, PowerPoint presentation. Uh, he doesn't have a list of names of people and their needs. Uh, he re simply resorts back to the grace of God as the source for their generosity. And he says this. He says, I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love is also genuine. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, Yet for your sake, he became poor so that you by his poverty might become rich. Uh, we take this meal every single week because what we say and what we testify when we take this is that we have received an inheritance through and in Jesus, not only that we don't deserve, but that we can never earn on our own efforts. It is by God's grace through his son that we are able to be in union and have fellowship with him who is our highest good. There is nothing better in this world than being with God himself. And because of Jesus, we get to celebrate that. That's why we do this every single week. So in a moment, I'm gonna pray and then the trays will be passed. Uh, there's two cups stacked on each other. Uh, the bottom cup has a piece of bread that represents Jesus' body that was broken for us. And the top cup has juice in it that represents a Jesus' blood that was spilt and covers us today. If you are not a follower of Jesus, if this is new to you, hey, that's okay. We're gonna have scriptures on the screen that you can read and process through uh, that kind of point us towards what this moment signifies. But also there's gonna be people at the prayer tables, the tables on the back after service with lights on them that we would love to have a conversation and help you figure out what it looks like to follow Jesus as well. But let's pray for today's communion. Uh, Father, we thank you for Jesus. And we thank you that in him, because of his sacrifice, that there are unsearchable riches. That, Father, there is nothing better than being with Jesus in the new life that we are able to experience because of our union and fellowship with him. So, Father, I pray over the people in this room who are followers of Jesus that you would just continue to grow that new life in them. And for, Father, those who have not submitted to you yet, who, do, who don't know you yet, that, Father, your spirit would just continue to call them home, to call them to you. So, Father, be with these people. May you remind us that we are your sons and your daughters and that you are the most high king. And we praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, hello, and thank you for joining us for the preaching of God's Word. Whether you're checking us out for the first time or coming back for our online weekly gathering, our hope is that you have an experience with Jesus that makes you long for more. The truth is, our lives were made for Him, and we believe that we can experience the fullness of the life He offers by participating in the life of the church, which isn't a building to occupy or a screen to observe, but the community of people who call Jesus King. So we would love to invite you to come to our in-person gatherings, which we have Thursday at 645 and Sunday at 8, 915 and 1045. We know that not everyone's circumstances allow them to gather in person, but we do believe that experiencing Jesus can't be complete if it's only contained to an hour of an online service. And we want more than that for you. We want you to join a community of Jesus followers and consume the word of God, the bread and cup of the Lord's table, the encouragement found as many worship him, but to also to give. 
that you would be a blessing by singing, listening, sacrificing, participating, and being an encouragement to others who need your life and testimony to remind them of the greatness of our God. And if you have more questions about Christ Church, we're here for you. We'd love to connect and together experience completeness in Jesus. We'll see you soon. I was a student at Ozark Christian College uh, from 2011 to 2015. And every year they put on a, a conference called Preaching and Teaching. And uh, what it is, it's an opportunity for a lot of the alumni and a lot of the local pastors to get together just to network and to talk with one another, but to hear some great teaching and have some breakout sessions and just kind of get filled up uh, for the rest of the year's ministry. And uh, every main session kind of goes the same. You have like some announcements, you have some worship, you have some great uh, preaching, uh, more worship at the end. And at the end, uh, they always take up an offering. And I always found that interesting because I'm like, man, these people paid a lot of money to go to college. Uh, a lot of them support the school throughout the year financially. And then they paid money to be at this conference. And now you're asking them for more money. And I'm like, man, how do they get away with this? And uh, one time, Kenny Bowles, who was a long-term professor there, uh, he got up to give the offering spiel. And he, it was just, it was classic. And he just grabbed the mic and he said, here's the deal, folks. We need money. You have money. Let's pray. <laughs> and I thought about coming out here and trying that today. And I was just like, I don't think I'm good enough to pull that off. I ain't been here long enough. But... I was like, but I can share that story. Uh, the fact is, and also I know some of you guys, uh, you probably grew up in a church that mis, uh, misused funds. And I just didn't want to like play into that narrative as well. Because that's, that's not how we do it here. But uh, the thing is, we are a church that understands that every single thing we have is from the Lord. Uh, we, we, even if we have the ability to work, that is from the Lord or whatever, everything we have, it is, it is from God. And we just want to give that back to him, whether small or large. And we want to use that to extend the kingdom, just like Paul was encouraging the church in Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Hey, we just want to spread the gospel because that is all we have. As the people of God, all we have is the gospel. And we want to share that. So I just want to say thank you uh, for partnering with us financially. Whether you give a cash or check in the bags that are about to be passed or are online or however it is, just thank you. Thank you for making that sacrifice. And thank you uh, for helping us uh, just accomplish what we feel God is calling us to do in our community and around the world. So I'm going to pray for us and then the guys are going to pass the bags. Uh, Father, I thank you. Um, for the gift that you have given us uh, financially, um, the ability not only to enjoy the things of this world, but to provide for our families and uh, the, the ability to work and to find purpose and significance in that and to play our part in helping steward creation and making this world work the way that you've created it uh, to be done. So Father, we pray that these offerings, this, this money would just be blessed and multiplied uh, for uh, your ministry, your effort to allow as many people as possible to understand just how tremendously they are loved uh, by you. So, Father, we thank you and we praise in Jesus' name. Amen. A few months ago, my family was at uh, one of our local playgrounds. This is something my family of four loves to do. When we go to the playgrounds, uh, we have our routine. Uh, my wife and I, we have two kids. Our 10-month-old, his name is Murph. One of us will sit with Murph on uh, like under a pavilion or under a shade tree. The other will go with our two-year-old Willie to the playground and play with him. This particular day, I was with Willie. Willie loves to climb on jungle gyms. He's something of a modern-day Tarzan, a prodigy, if you will. Our family just signed a deal with Netflix. They're, he's going to be free soloing all the jungle gyms in Jasper County. It'll be a thriller. I hope you watch. He was enthralled that we got to go to this three-story jungle gym, and he made quick work of the first story, easy path through the second story. And he wanted to go through to the third story, but I wouldn't let him, and here's why. On the third story, there was a group of about six kids, likely a neighborhood biker gang, and uh, they were using words that we don't use in the Holderman house. You know what I'm saying? And uh, Well, Murphy does, but the rest of us don't. He uh, came out cussing like a sailor. 
So Willie, as a two-year-old, is in this stage where he is learning new words all the time. Not necessarily words that we're trying to teach him. He's just picking up on new words. Example, uh, sometimes my wife calls me babe. I know, public displays of affection are weird at church. But uh, Willie has been picking this up and will often refer to me as babe, which is (laughs) not cute in my opinion. But... uh, Last night, we're at Home Depot. Andrea is pushing the boys in the Home Depot cart with the little steering wheels. I'm searching in an aisle, and I hear from behind me, babe, babe. And it's not Andrea, it's Willie. And uh, there's a bunch of other guys around me. I can't acknowledge that's my son because that's weird. They're going to be judging me. So I just left. I left him. So (laughs) he's still at Home Depot if you go today, if if you could bring him back. Uh, but he's learning a lot of new words right now, and I don't need him going up to the third story, learning some of these choice words, going back to early childhood and dropping bombs during story time. You know what I'm saying? Can't have that. And uh, so I say, we're going to go back down, buddy, and uh, he's upset. But we start heading back down. A lady comes, and she starts addressing the issue on the third story. And I think to myself, uh, finally. Somebody is here to address the problems. One of the parents has taken responsibility. And I am shocked when uh, the oldest of the boys um, responds to her, basically telling her to shut her mouth using some expletives in his response. And I think to myself, I need to say something to this boy because that's not how you treat people. Uh, But before I can act, she responds with some of her own choice words and she starts lacing her comments with, I mean, she's putting the pro in profanity. This lady is experienced in cussing children out. Like this is the only explanation of why she was so good at it. And uh, I'm just, I'm just shocked. Hoping Willie's not picking up any of these words. After about 60 to 90 seconds, she asks the boy uh, a question. She says, where are your parents? And I'm just dumbfounded because I thought that was her child. She's, <laughs> she's cussing out some random kid on a playground, you know? And in that moment, I had, I had the thought um, that the way of the world is just different than the way of heaven, you know? Like it is. As followers of Jesus, we're called to be in the world, but not of the world. Like we're called to go to the playgrounds, but not cuss kids out while we're there. We are called to be different. John chapter 17, Jesus prayed this over his disciples. I'm not asking that you take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. They do not belong to this world any more than I do. Make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. And the apostle Paul wrote a letter to uh, the Christians in Rome. They were living in a city with far more ludicrous issues than people cussing each other out. And he said this to them. I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. As followers of Jesus, citizens of heaven, there should be a noticeable difference between the way we live and the way of the world. But you know that's not always the case. In many areas of life, the church looks far more like the world than it does like Jesus. And this should not be the case. And before I'm blamed for it, no, this is not a sermon on moralism. This is a sermon on worship, glorifying God in every aspect of our life by the way in which we live. Today's topic, wealth. Now, I don't want to brag, but I'm pretty qualified to talk on this subject. For starters, I'm in the top 10 richest people in the world, not too shabby, all right? And uh, my crowning achievement in the area of wealth is that I am a graduate of Financial Peace University, and I have the credentials. I went to school for this. Now, you don't care to hear my musings on the subject, uh, which is why we're going to search the scriptures today, wisdom literature in the Bible to find out how we should deal with this topic. And and do we really need to deal with this topic? A few months ago, I was in Barbados visiting one of our impact partners, Pastor Ken Roy Clark. He is uh, the pastor of a church in Barbados and does ministry work around the Caribbean. Uh, The church that he leads there is in a very impoverished community. He is intentionally in that community to serve the poor. I was there one Sunday morning, and I'm getting ready to preach, but before I preach, I'm greeting people at the door, the bane of an introvert pastor's existence, greeting people at church. But I'm doing this because this is what I've been called to do. Shake a man's hand and never met this man before with a big smile on his face. He just looks at me and said, brother, you are well fed. And uh, since then, I've lost 15 pounds, so... (laughs) 
<laughs> but uh, it didn't feel as like endearing as when my grandma would tell me I was a growing boy. You know, it felt a little bit different. But it turns out apparently it's actually a compliment um, because somebody in, in, in the Caribbean, in Barbados, uh, who is well-fed means they are well taken care of, mean God has favor on them. Why is that the case? Because a lot of people in Barbados, most people around the world are incredibly poor, very poor. This man had one change of clothes. He slept in the shed of, a, of another church member doing a hard work for a meager income. Now, I told you earlier that I was in the top 10 richest percent of people in the world. I don't know if that's actually true, but there are websites you can go to, put in your income, how many people are in your household, and it'll tell you where you rank in the world. And I'm guessing that because you live in this country, you will rank pretty high. We are a wealthy people who live in a wealthy place, both communally and individually. Communally, our infrastructure is amazing compared to the rest of the world's standards. And I know you've driven down I-44 in Oklahoma, not necessarily a description of amazing that we would shoot for, but that we can drive on public roads, that we can go into convenience stores if we need to go to the restroom and get water for free in many places. These are things that are unheard of in other countries. Individually, that we own our own home. Some of us do own our own cars, that some of our kids have their own bedrooms, that we have refrigerators and freezers stocked with food. In most parts of the world, these are luxuries. To us, they're commonplace. We are a wealthy people who live in a wealthy place. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but we do need to address the topic of wealth. Lucky for us, the Bible addresses it quite a bit. It's one of the most talked about subjects in the scriptures, over 2,000 verses. So I just need to let you know, we'll be here through the end of third hour. Uh, it's gonna be a little longer today. No, we cannot address every single uh, topic today, which is a dangerous approach to preaching. Because with a topic like wealth, where the Bible speaks so much about it, you could really make the Bible say whatever you want it to say. Last week after I preached, I was in the lobby and one of my neighbors came up to me. We don't know each other all that well. She lives down the road from me. And uh, she came up to me and she goes, wow, this is wild because I used to think that you were a criminal and now I found out you're a preacher. And uh, I was like, hold on, what, what do you mean? And uh, we, she explained herself and I'm not a criminal, but I'll just leave you in suspense as to what the story was. But I tell you that because there are preachers, people who claim to be people of God who are criminal in the way they handle and preach on this subject. So here is my beg of you. Would you study this for yourself? Outside of the sermon that is preached today, you need to search the scriptures for wisdom on wealth, because you really could make the Bible say whatever you want it to say. If you want the Bible to tell you to be rich, I mean, turn to the book of Malachi and let the floodgates open, baby. Come on. If you want the Bible to tell you to be poor, I know a rich young ruler who you should, well, not follow in his example. You want the story of financial redemption? We know a wee little man, don't we? Stories of financial corruption? Go talk to Ananias and Sapphira, but hurry, for they won't be there long. If you don't get that joke, they lied about their wealth and died on the spot. So don't lie about your wealth. I want to give you the context today of the scriptures that we will be studying. I want you to think father having conversation with son, mother with daughter, mentor with mentee, wisdom in wealth. We're primarily in the wisdom literature of the Bible, and I want to approach the Bible by asking questions. The first question, how should I make money? Notice, the question is not how can I make money? You need to consult Forbes for that. I'm not great at making money. How should I make money? We're talking about holiness and our financial earnings. Solomon said this in Proverbs 6, 6 make money through hard work. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest. How long will you lie there, you sluggard? When will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a thief and scarcity like an armed man. I first learned the principle of this proverb when I went to work for my grandpa, John. It was about 10 years old. Like many young boys who had yet to have been called to it, hard work was not a virtue in my life. But then my grandpa gave me a push mower in the hot days of summer and said, go. I started mowing his rental properties for him while he parked a lawn chair underneath a shade tree sipping on his lemonade. You know what I'm saying? And uh, if I ever took a break or to get a sip of water, uh, he would just holler from his shade tree, back to work, sluggard. And uh, no, he didn't do that. He was a very kind man. But 
he did make sure I worked hard and did a good job. And he was gracious enough to make sure the work day ended in time that we could go to grandma's house for a bowl of Neapolitan ice cream. I loved working with my grandpa. It was where I learned the value of hard work. And the best part of the day is when he would hand me a 20 or a 50, sometimes a hundred dollar bill for the hard work that I did for him. And I have to confess to you, my church, that I don't think I paid taxes on that money. So I'm sorry I was 10. I didn't know any better. With my grandpa, I learned this. Lazy hands make for poverty, but diligent hands bring wealth. My grandpa was the hardest worker I've ever known. We have a lot of hard workers here at Christ Church. A lot of people who work with their hands, a lot of teachers in the school districts, a lot of people who build homes, a lot of people who lead meetings, a lot of people who manage facilities, a lot of people who help heal others' bodies. We have a lot of people who work hard. And it is right and good that you earn an income for the work that you do. While we're on the subject of hard work, though, I know there are a lot of people who do work hard who don't earn an income. I think of stay-at-home parents who work hard, not necessarily for an income, but for their children's well-being. I think of students in the classroom who not necessarily earn an income, although some of your parents pay you to make good grades, and you're spoiled. But that's my opinion. Uh, So, but you could work hard to earn good grades or to possibly earn a scholarship for the hard work that you do, you know? Hard work is a virtue. But here's the thing, as followers of Jesus, we don't work hard to make money, we don't work hard to get scholarships. The primary reason for the way, the reason that we work hard is this, we work hard to glorify God. Like I said earlier, this is not a sermon on moralism, this is a sermon on worship. The way in which we work reflects the image of our working God, who has worked hard, and we do so as well, to honor and glorify him. The best part is, well, not the best part, but a side part is we make money a lot of the times that we do that, so it's good. Apostle Paul writing to Christian slaves who had received no paycheck or salary for their work said this in Colossians 3, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. We're working for God's glory, which means we have to work in the way of God. So the second answer to the question, how should I make money, is this. Make money with godly integrity. Solomon wrote, tainted wealth has no lasting value, but right living can save your life. The Lord will not let the godly go hungry, but he refuses to satisfy the craving of the wicked. And I don't need to belabor this point much for I'm sure you understand it, but I will offer this encouragement. Do the work of Christ in the way of Christ. If you sell cars, don't inflate prices for ungodly gain. If you're a landlord, keep the place in good condition for your tenants who are children of God. If you're a builder, don't cut codes or ignore corners. If you're a minister, be close to the Father rather than acting like you are. The primary purpose of our work is not to make money, but to glorify God and bring value to people. So many people in the culture in which we live work not to bring value to God, but also they work to steal valuables from other people. Not so with us. The way in which we work should be with a godly integrity that does not steal value from people, but brings and adds value to them. This is the way we will work. Third, on the question of how should I make money, Make money without losing freedom. I'm talking about debt. Wisdom isn't always a call to action. It's often a call to reflect and remember the way in which the world around us works. Solomon wrote, the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is slave to the lender. Earlier this week, my friend and coworker, Allison, who leads a right here, right now ministry, she works with a lot of people in financial pain. She showed me something evil, an interest rate of 119%. Debt can enslave, it can enslave, and the loss is freedom. Now, full transparency, I have a home mortgage and a couple of credit cards. My home is modest, my interest rate is low, and I pay off my credit card sometimes before the charges post to my account. Type A about that. There are examples in scripture of people borrowing items or money, but in every acceptable context, what is borrowed is small, and what is borrowed is paid back. Only about 10% of references to debt in scripture are viewed in a positive light. In many scriptural references to debt, freedom is lost. And 
This should be avoided at all cost. In Christ, you were bought with a price and your debt has been paid. Let's not become slaves again by taking on financial debt that we cannot pay back. Let's be satisfied in God, not losing our freedom to greed. Let's work hard, work with integrity, and not become slaves to debt. And now, because you've lived in this way, your bank account is just busting at the seams. Like, you feeling good? Feel real good, right? Bank account is full. So the second question we're asking the wisdom of God is this. What should I do with my money? What should I do with the money I have? First and foremost, the wisdom of God says this. Honor God with the money that you have. Solomon wrote, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best part of everything you produce. Throughout history, the people of God have offered their first fruits to him. This language points back to the agrarian nature of God's people who would take the first harvest of grain or livestock. Now, we started a garden this spring in our family, and you better believe that when that first tomato is ripe, we'll be bringing it here to church and dropping it in the offering basket as our first fruits offering to God. The reality is most of us don't have crop or livestock to bring to church. And if you do, maybe just give it to a neighbor or something. You don't need to bring it here or sell it and bring the money here. The first fruits is equivalent to the tithe, which is the first 10% of what you produce. And because if the work of most of us produces a paycheck, that would be the first 10% of our paycheck. The people of God have always been called to give as an offering to him 10%, to give as a tithe the first 10% of our income to God. My family, many others, have chosen to give that money to the place where we call home, here, Christ Church of Orinoco. Some of you in the room might be thinking, man, I am like 18 years old. My 10% is like 10 bucks a month. I mean, is it really going to make that big of a, a difference here at church? And I want you to stop that thinking. Does the money that is given here to church keep the lights on, the AC running? Yes, it does. Does it pay the salaries of the ministers? Yes, it does. And thank you very much. But what it primarily does, the tithe, whether it's 10 bucks, 100 bucks, 1,000 bucks, is it brings honor and glory to God. Remember, this is a sermon on worship. We give because we trust God. Speaking of trust, I know that some of you in the room have probably found yourself in a place where you're not sure if you can afford that 10%. I want to ask you to study the scriptures on this subject before you act, but I want to I encourage you to trust God in your giving. Even when it's tight, even when the numbers don't make sense, trust God. And the baseline of what God calls us to give is 10%. We tithe to worship God. Secondly, the wisdom of God is this. Be generous with the money that you have. Wait a second. We just talked about the tithe not 10 seconds ago. Now we're supposed to give more money away? Well, that was the tithe and this is the offering. So it's fun. No, this is the offering, this extra generosity is not necessarily a designated amount or place of giving. I like to call this creative giving. Uh, some of you in the church do this really well. Some of you give above and beyond simply to the general operating budget of the church. Others of you to right here, right now, where you bring a dollar per person from your family and give so we can help people in need. Some of you choose a missionary or an organization that resonates with your, your family's passions to support the work that they are doing. Some of you have uh, let people live in your, your homes for free or given people cars. There are all kinds of ways to be generous with what you have. And if you've ever been generous, then you know this to be true. It's really fun to give, right? Solomon said, a generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. It is really fun to give. So church, pick something you're passionate about, find somebody in need, and man, bless them with what you have. Third, save the money you have. There is biblical wisdom in saving some of your money. The wise store up choice food and olive oil, but fools gulp theirs down. Dishonest money dwindles away, but whoever gathers money little by little makes it grow. And with this money that you save, you could save up for a big purchase so you don't have to take on enslaving debt. This money could be saved in case of emergencies. This money could be invested so that you can put it towards something you're passionate about and in our country gain interest that works for you rather than against you. I am the beneficiary of my family's wives' savings, my grandparents, who put money into a college savings account that I was able to use when scholarships did not uh, come through. 
my great aunt, who was like a grandma to me, who when I was born, she put money into an investment account. When I was 18, my parents told me about that account, told me to use it wisely, and that became the down payment on our home. Because you save, you can be prepared for emergencies. Because you save, you can be prepared to bless. There is wisdom, godly wisdom, in saving some of the money that you have. And lastly, on what should I do with my money? I want to say this because I think the scriptures say it. Be content with the money you have. In studying for this sermon, I read a proverb that describes America to a T. One person pretends to be rich, yet has nothing. Another pretends to be poor, yet has great wealth. Confession time. Materialism is a struggle for me. It's an area in which I have sinned and an area in which I regularly face temptation. I'm sure I'm not the only one in the room. I think I face this temptation so often because of the culture in which I live. A culture that says you will be satisfied with bigger, better, and more stuff. And even though I know that's not true, it's still, still the cultural pull on my life to get more stuff. I mean, think about this as our cultural irony. Both bankruptcies and storage units are on the incline, meaning we keep buying stuff that we cannot afford even though we don't have a place to put it. Bigger, better, more. And I don't know why, but maybe it's because it feels right and holy. But when I find out that someone I know who seems to have a meager and humble existence is a millionaire, I just immediately have respect for them, you know? Not necessarily because they made the money, but because the money hasn't made them. It's inspiring. I'll use this word, it's holy. And it's not just rich people who can be content. That gentleman who told me I had a dad bod in Barbados, you remember him? One of the poorest people I know lives in a shed, has one change of clothes. Poorest. But has so much joy. Not in what he has in material items, but what he has in God. His satisfaction is found in God. Nothing that you can buy will ever satisfy. So I want to ask you a third question now. This one's a little bit more personal. You ready? Are you satisfied in God? Our culture will only be satisfied with wealth. But what about you, church? Are you satisfied in God? St. Augustine said, our hearts are restless until they can find rest in you. The author of Ecclesiastes wrote this on the subject of money. Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This too is meaningless. Money will never satisfy the eternal longings of our heart. It simply can't. The Apostle Paul wrote this, those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Again, the author of Ecclesiastes, I have seen a grievous evil under the sun, wealth hoarded to the harm of its owners. Money cannot satisfy your heart, church, but it certainly can destroy your heart. And it has over and over and over again. So I plead with you, if you are feeling the pool of culture for bigger, better, more, you'll finally be satisfied. Then I want you to pray this prayer, Proverbs chapter 30, verses 8 and 9. Keep falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal and so dishonor the name of my God. Jim Elliott was a missionary to an unreached people in Ecuador. By the grace of God, he made the decision to go and evangelize a tribe, even though they were known to be hostile to outsiders, murdering every missionary who had gone before. Jim Elliott's fate was the same. But before he went on his mission, 
in response to the people who were telling him to settle down, to find a nice life in the States, or at least go to a tribe that wasn't so hostile, he responded with this holy reply. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. The apostle Paul wrote to a young church leader named Timothy, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Church, on the topic of wealth, as we're pressured on every side to be conformed to a culture that pursues the worship of and the acquisition of wealth, can I speak this word over you one more time with wealth on our minds? In the words of Jim Elliott, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. You will lose the money in your wallet. You will lose the homes that you live in, but you will never lose God, for he will never lose you. Church, would you stand and worship with us this morning? You gave your life for mine Nailed to the cross You crucified All my sin and shame It was washed by your mercy And you are the treasure I find My reason for living So
our King. Our whole life is for you. I pray that we would be able to come before you with our hearts surrendered, that we might give up that, that which we cannot keep, that we might acquire what we cannot lose, which is you. We need you so desperately, good King. We have nothing without you. We love you and we are looking to you, we are listening. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You're dismissed, have a great week.